Welcome to Keto Life Support, where we make your keto life sustainable, fun, and low stress. I'm Kim Howerton, and I'll be coming to you weekly with some of my keto besties to bring you the practical, real-world keto advice that you need. Quick disclaimer, I am not a doctor, and even if we do have a doctor in the house from time to time, he or she is not your doctor, and nothing we say on this show should be taken as medical advice. Always check in with a trusted medical professional about your own personal medical concerns. Hello, and welcome to Keto Life Support. This is Kim Howerton, coming to you with episode number 73, and on this episode, I get to talk with the effervescent Siobhan Huggins. Siobhan is, if you guys don't know, you should. She's a speaker at conferences. She is Dave Feldman's right-hand person. She is part of Own Your Labs and Cholesterol Code. She is just a central figure in a lot going on in cholesterol research. And she's also somebody who is just a keto enthusiast and a nutrition enthusiast and a what is going on with my body and your body and all the bodies enthusiast. So we're going to dive into a number of topics. Her journey, her recent lipedema diagnosis, what that means, what that looks like. We go into all sorts of nooks and crannies. This is not just to talk about cholesterol. This is a catch up with a good friend and also a lot of topics that I think a lot of you will be interested in. So I hope you enjoy my chat with Siobhan. Hello and welcome to Keto Life Support. I am here with my good friend, Siobhan Huggins. Hey, Siobhan. Hi. (laughs) How's it going? Uh, Life's been weird. (laughs) Career stuff, all this stuff. So Siobhan, if you guys don't know, if you've been living in a hole, Siobhan is the co-founder of Own Your Labs and the colleague of somebody you may have heard of, Dave Feldman. Together, they make Cholesterol Code work for you. And they also run something called Own Your Labs, which is a company that allows you to get your own blood tested, which is amazing. Does that cover what you're up to these days, Siobhan? Yeah, I'm also doing a lot of like researchy type stuff, looking into various topics, trying to figure out how things work, kind of what I've always been doing pretty much. Got it. So it seems like you, so you got into keto, right? Like at some point in your life, and then you found the stuff that Dave was doing with cholesterol. Was that your first like solid jump into sort of professional researching? Yeah, I would definitely say so. So I got into keto in August of 2016. And I mean, I looked quite a bit different than I was 240 pounds and hypertensive and chronically depressed, just very cheerful, wonderful person. And smiling was not something you were really connected to. Yeah, I've seen the Uh, pictures. (laughs) Yeah, it's different person entirely, I feel like. Uh, And as a result of that, I ended up looking into like keto podcasts and I came across the two keto dudes because they had interviewed Tom Naughton and I had just watched Fathead recently And they were doing this Keto Fest thing. So I went to Keto Fest and then met Dave and he was like interconnecting this cholesterol metabolism thing with like distributed object networks and a techie viewpoint. And I was working in IT at the time and I was like, this is amazing and awesome. And I started looking into it immediately after that conference. And before that, I definitely read a lot just in general I would passively look into topics. So if a question came up on a keto forum, then I would kind of look into it and see if I could dig up an answer and bring it back. But I wasn't actively looking into topics like I do now. So Dave definitely inspired that (laughs) and has to do so. Did you have any cholesterol concerns at the time or were you more just like, this is fascinating and I want to dive in? I mean, I knew I had high cholesterol at the time, but I honestly didn't think about it very much. At the Mm -hmm. time, I was like, well, I mean, my main concerns are being really overweight and what kind of toll that has on its health or whatever has caused the obesity is doing to my health was my main concern. So it was kind of in my peripheral and my dad had had a heart attack when I was very young, when I was eight, actually. He is fine now, (laughs) but it's a traumatic thing. And so I was aware of the heart disease stuff and kind of what everyone had, you know, talked about in general, 
basically a layperson knowledge. And yeah, so it was mostly, you know, this is really fascinating and I want to figure out both how Dave's brain works, because <laughs> that was an interesting aspect for me. And then also how cholesterol metabolism and all this stuff works, because it was talked about by Dave as this complex, fascinating just system. And I was like, I want to know how that works. <laughs> Got it. Also, I mean, comparatively speaking, if you had found keto at 40 or something, you, you may have been more personally concerned about your numbers. But how old were you at that point? Uh, that was in 2016, so I would have been like 20 or 21 or so. Yeah, so a youngin. A baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, you got into this research, you started researching with Dave. At that point, you had started on your keto journey, but you hadn't lost as much, you've lost a lot more weight now. Yeah, so at the time of Keto Fest, I had lost maybe like 40 to 50 pounds. So I've lost a little bit more than that. And then there's also been recomposition and stuff, of course, as mm -hmm. well. Um, but I was still fairly early in. I had started in August of 2016. And then I went to Keto Fest in July of 2017. So it was a pretty quick turnaround. And I was still getting my sea legs, I think. And kind of like, how, <laughs> how far is this going to take me? Like, when's it going to stop working? <laughs> And then by, was it the next Keto Fest that you were speaking on stage? Yeah, um, that was the first presentation I ever did for anything, ever. Wow. <laughs> She's done more presentations since then, people. So, yes. <laughs> um, tell me, like, how did that feel doing that? The question just popped into my head, like, how did it feel to, like, master the topic in a way that people want you to talk about it? confusing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> utterly baffling. I mean, even at the time, I didn't feel like I had mastered the topic. But at the very yeah. least, I knew things from papers that I had read that I feel like either people didn't know about at all or weren't really discussed. And so from my viewpoint, it was like, well, maybe I can share these things with other people mm -hmm. and they'll find them interesting. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much how I approach every presentation nowadays. It's like, well, I don't see this talked about. Or I don't see this talked about in a way that I would want to talk about it. So let me talk about it. <laughs> so for me, like I'm not, I'm still not very much of a public speaker. I still get the shakes and start like internally sweating <laughs> and freaking out and all that type of stuff. But I do it anyway, because if I don't do it, then I'll just sit around and complain that it doesn't exist. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, I think that's a good point. People have often asked, you know, in the keto world out there, you know, over the internet will be, will say things like, oh, you know so much about this. I'm like, I don't know that much about it. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, I just ask a lot of questions. And I remember my experience when I first started going to conferences and I would, I mean, there are certainly some speakers where I understand every single thing they say, but there are a lot of speakers where I'm like, I got like a quarter of that. But then I'll be like, okay, writing things down, like I need to look this up and what was that? And what was that study? And what was that citation? it's more like a jumping off point and year after year, like you hope you get 10% more of what somebody is talking about, but that it's more about the curiosity than it is about the mastery. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, recently over the past year or so, I've been working on learning a second language and I feel like it's very much the same thing where it's like, you're never going to master a language. That's not a thing. <laughs> but each time you watch a video from someone speaking that language or you read a comic in that language or whatever, you get a little bit more. And it's just really satisfying to be like, I recognize that word. I understand mm -hmm. that pathway, like all that type of stuff. And I feel much the same about learning in general. It, yeah, it kind of goes together. It's just endless curiosity. Well, how does that work? Well, they were talking about this thing, but does it actually work that way? Maybe it actually works this different way. It's long been one of my frustrations in being somebody who talks about things in the world. Like, you know, like we all are, right? If we're on the internet and we talk about things that I think a lot of people, so there are a lot of what I'll call them influencers. We call them educators. You can call them whatever you want. But like there are a lot of people talking on the internet and new people are very attracted to confidence, right? And there are some people out there who they're like, this is how it is, 100%, all the time, exactly this. <laughs> and yeah, like that attracts a lot of people, but it tends to be that 
there's a learning curve that only people who don't know very much are very confident in that way. Right. Because uh, once it's like you... the Dunning Kruger effect. Exactly. <laughs> it's like you have to you have to actually intentionally shut out a ton of information to be that confident. It's actually I don't know is often the mark of a s- intelligent person. Somebody who will say, I don't know, but let me find out or I don't know, but let me look into that. Yeah, for sure. And I try to be careful about it myself. Like I try to be careful about my language and stuff that I say. Like I try not to say this works this way unless it's been like 100% confirmed. And then people will ask me a question and it's like, well, <laughs> and then I have to go on this like long speech of like, I think it works this way, but it could also totally not be true at all. And so a lot of my presentations are basically just, I think it works this way Mm -hmm. based off of the information that we have, but I'm open to later saying, oh, actually that's wrong. Never mind. Completely forget. Right. I mean, I have to say like a good 30, I'm being generous to myself. I would say like, I look back on a lot of things that I said, maybe my first two years of keto (laughs) and I, it is so cringy. I'm like, cringe inducing. Yeah. "Oh, Oh, I can't believe I said that to people or like, I don't know. So the other day I said, you know, that that phrase, I'm sorry for the things I said when I was hungry. I was like, I'm sorry for the things I said when I was stupid. Like, yeah. there's just, ignorant, you know, ignorant, not stupid, just ignorant. <laughs> just ignorant I mean, yeah. I think everybody has that stage where it's like, yeah. wow, this is like a whole new world. And this explains everything. And this is how it works. And then you start getting more into the details. And it's like, oh, actually, this is really complicated. <laughs> but right. It helps because it's a little bit closer than you were before. And then as you learn more, you can tweak things and change things and eventually get hopefully closer to where you need to be. But Right. I mean, I lost 60 pounds doing keto in a way that I now I'm like, there were a lot of mistakes made in that period of time. But at the same time, like I lost 60 pounds. Like I'm not, you know, so clearly something was working. Yeah, Um, it's, it's less what I was doing than how I was holding it, I think, like how I was, how I was thinking about it, and how I was considering it, and what I felt like was rules that I had to and shouldn't fall, you know what I mean? It was Mm -hmm. the thing that in hindsight, I feel more, wow, I now this is like a therapy session, do I have to pay you for this? No, it was like, the things I feel more like, oh, gosh, like sort of cringy about are more like beliefs I held than actions I took. Yeah, a little bit of uh, zealotry, I think. And yeah, feel the same way. Like, for me, I'm not so much like, I don't feel like I did things wrong in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I think I did the best I could with what I had, like with the information that I had. But there was definitely some zealotry in like the first year. And then I got more into the research and it was like, oh, well, I don't really think that stuff anymore. And luckily, I didn't say it like super loud anywhere. Because yeah. you're not <laughs> mostly, like a big loud mouth like I am. Yeah, mostly it was like venting to mom because mm-hmm. um, she was also doing keto with me and still is technically. It's a learning curve. And I think that's OK. People are allowed to say things that are wrong and then turn around later and be like, I was being ignorant. Never mind. We have all been teenagers at one point or another. Yeah. So we should all have a little humility about that situation. So yeah. For so sure. one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, um, you know, over the past few years recently, I've gotten very into what some would call more of a lower, not low, but lower fat, higher protein approach to eating still kind of in the low carb keto space. But it's been something that I've kind of veered into that seems to work better for my body. But I've been very, very interested in, you know, the fact that keto or any diet is not one size fits all. And you've taken a very different approach. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so it all started, uh, geez, I guess in July 2019 is when I did the experiment where I had been hearing a lot of talk about like these two camps of people in the keto sphere, which was like the high protein camp and the you don't need high protein and you don't need to limit fat camp with some caveats on that side. Um, That's a much and- longer name. <laughs> It's also called keto AF as in keto animal foods. So it's basically just high fat carnivore, but it comes with this kind of protocol to help you eat higher fat without restricting protein. Because Mm. I personally don't want to restrict protein. If my protein goes too low, I get cravings for lean meat and all this stuff. And it's not comfortable. 
And so I put together this experiment with the help of my friends, Josh and Amber. And I was like, I'm just going to test this and see what happens because I'm super curious. And even for myself, I was like, there's no way this is going to work because the way it was set up is I would eat basically pure fat and it was beef trim. So just beef fat until I was fat full. And then I would eat my lean, which was cooked ribeye. And I would eat that until I was protein full. I was like, I'm just going to like keep eating fat forever and I'll gain like 10 gajillion pounds at the end of this. <laughs> And it's just not going to work. And so it was very interesting for me because there was like a couple day adjustment period where sometimes I'd eat way under what I normally do. And sometimes I would eat like a fair amount above, but then eventually it settled out and it ended up being that compared to my baseline, which was about 30% protein when I was eating, uh, I think it was like 12% protein in this scenario with the fat first approach, I was eating the same amount of calories, but at the same time, I think it was like 100 or 200 calories less. So not technically the same, but fairly close and not more. And I was losing weight at the same time. And (laughs) at that time I had been stalled for a little while. And I was just like, I don't know what to do because I'm not calorie restricting because for me, it worsens my mood and it makes me super hungry and it's just not sustainable for me. So it's like, okay, let's try it. And it ended up working for me. And I felt like I had a lot of energy and all this type of stuff. And it was so fascinating. And I was curious, like, why does this work? (laughs) Why could this possibly work? And then I know some other people, um, a mutual friend of ours, April, she had had some health issues as well. And she had tried all sorts of things. She had been keto for two years. She had done higher protein carnivore, but she wasn't losing weight. And her diabetes hadn't gone into remission, which is like what keto is supposed to be (laughs) one of the things it can be used for. And it just wasn't working. And ultimately she tried high fat carnivore with like butter on every single bite of, I think it was like ground beef or something. And her blood sugar started coming down. She started losing weight. Her appetite was more regulated. She could comfortably fast, like all this type of stuff. And it's like, what? <laughs> How does this work exactly? And I think there's still like a lot of stuff that we just don't know yet. Um, yeah. But Amber in particular has focused a lot on the science of it. And so I've picked up some things here and there. One of the interesting things about it is people are like, well, if you do this, aren't you like not going to get enough protein? And one of the interesting things is that if you, there can be some signaling stuff that happens when you eat. And one of the things that can happen is if you're hungry and then you eat like lean protein, for example, your energy needs need to be met. And so you can end up using some of that protein for energy. And it's like, okay, that's not ideal because personally for me, I want my protein to be going towards substrate. (laughs) Like I want to be using it to build muscle and all this type of stuff and maintain the stuff that I have. And so the, basically the way of thinking of it with the fat first approach is that you're meeting your energy needs with the fat that you're consuming. And then once your energy needs have been met, then you'll get satiated on the fat and you won't want to consume anymore. And then you can eat the lean and all of that, or at least, a lot of it is going to be going towards maintenance of structures and building of structures and all that type of stuff. And the useful thing is that it's not restricted. So if you have like a heavy workout day or whatever it is, and your protein hunger ends up being more then you just eat more protein. (laughs) And likewise, if you work out a ton and your energy needs are higher, then you'll just eat more fat in that day. And it's really interesting to me. how it can work for some people. And one thing I try to emphasize is, like you said, this is not a one size fits all. There are some people that I've noticed that this tends to work well for, and some people who do perfectly fine on a high protein approach, and it helps them with weight loss or maintaining their weight or whatever. Usually with the people I see who do very well on keto AF is the people who have lingering health issues. And I was certainly one of them, although I wasn't sure what the specific health issues were for a long time. So I try to present it as this is an option, 
but I'm not saying it's the only option. And I think there are some things that can be done to prevent pitfalls that can happen with it. Like if you have a lot of health issues, it may be, you know, take it as also an elimination diet trial and skip the dairy because <laughs> that can be an issue for some people. Um, and just see if it works or not. Does this only, does it really only work in the AF fashion as animal foods only? Like, have you seen anyone do this, but still include some minimal carbohydrates? I've seen some people do it, including spices and coffee and typical stuff that's usually hand waved with carnivore anyway, mm -hmm. with a substantial amount of, I mean, I have seen people do a high fat keto approach that was omnivorous and it works for them. And mm -hmm. so there's that. And in the case of, you know, the problem children who have lingering issues and they're just really struggling and they've tried basically everything else, then I think that kind of goes hand in hand with trying carnivore at that point, because it could be you have sensitivities that you don't know about. Right. And so usually people are trying keto AF as like this last ditch resort. <laughs> it is the last <laughs> resort, right? Yeah. Usually they have to go pretty far to get there. Yeah. Yeah. And so now I just refer to it as like the nuclear weapon of diets. Like if nothing else has worked, then at least we can try this. And I've done it with loved ones of mine who had some health issues. And it's like, all right, let's just try this and see if it works. And I mean, so far it has. And sometimes people try it and are like, this really isn't working for me or, you know, I'm not getting full or like any other number of things. And it's like, okay, well you tried. So at least you've crossed it off your list and you know, it's right. probably not going to work. There's very few things I feel like, you know, I mean, not like juggling chainsaws or something, but very few dietary interventions that one could do for 30 days that are going to cause big problems as a, yeah. you know, as let's try it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's one the thing that you tried, but. And then the other thing is like, because you're controlling the diet, it is helpful to set, you know, if this happens, then I'm going to stop for my own safety. Like if I have, I don't know, headaches or abdominal cramps, like I have the same kind of list for mm -hmm. if I'm doing any extended fasting, it's like if I experience any of these things, it's immediately stopped. You can take that time to pause and reevaluate and be like, oh, I think it was this issue. Or you can just say, I don't want to try it any further. And I think both of those are valid. Right. So one thing I didn't tell people about you, they may not know, is Siobhan spends most of her life experimenting, right? <laughs> it's um, Or, you know, it's part of the Feldman universe where it's, uh, let's see what happens if I do this and then get a lot of blood tests and take a lot of body measurements and see what changes. So it's not uncommon for her to go through various testing periods. And there are some tests that I think she says, I will never do again. And there are some tests she says, I might do this again. And so, you know, she's just a constant self-experimenter. And so I think for, for the listeners, you know, you should, I find that a very helpful point of view because it isn't one size fits all. Uh, you know, I'm always tweaking something about the way that I'm eating to see if that does this work better? Does that work better? But in ways that are livable, um, because we have to live our lives. And so I think it kind of makes sense. Siobhan, tell me if you agree, a lot of people will go keto, it'll work for a while. And, and when I say work, for the most part, I mean, there'll be fat loss, right? Like, I mean, that's what most people mean. But you know, it could also be that whatever issue you want alleviated is alleviated. But whatever, it'll there'll be progress for some period of time, a very small lucky few just continue all the way to everything is perfect. And they go about their merry way. But there's a good chunk of people who hit what one would call a stall or a plateau. And then there's a smaller group of people who started keto and didn't have any success at any point. Of these two groups, what I usually recommend to all these people to try first, because I do find it works more than less, is to try a higher protein, lower fat approach as an experiment and see if something shifts. But some people I put through that don't see a shift. They're just in the same place. Are you with me on my train of thought that the next thing when they're like, even that didn't work, even when I pushed the needle, even when I went as far as I could go without pulling all my hair out. At that point, would you say it's time for the nuclear bomb? Is it time to like try keto AF? 
Yeah, I mean, it really depends on what they're trying to do. Like, if they're trying to put diabetes into remission or a serious health issue, and of course, working with their healthcare team and everything, then it would make sense to do something more on the drastic end just to see if it works or at least rule it out. If it's like trying to lose an extra two pounds or something, and they're almost at their goal weight, it's like, well, I mean, is that trade off worth it for you? If it is, I mean, sure, why not? It's not like (laughs) I find high fat carnivore unpleasant, although it's a little bit tricky to get the hang of it at first. And yeah, I mean, that's typically what I tell people also is if whatever you're doing isn't working right now, and you're wanting to look at different macros, I mean, just try higher protein, give it like a good solid three weeks, and then try higher fat give it a good solid three weeks and then do the one that works best because I think it is going to vary on the person. And at least then you have a good idea of the two sides of things where it's like, well, I liked this aspect of it, but I didn't like this other aspect of it versus this other one. Do you kind of have a sample of two general options and then you can kind of go from there. And I'm definitely the same way in terms of tweaking the number of times I've just okay, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to try this now. I'm going to cut out all diet drinks for like three months and see what happens. I'm going to, you know, try an egg fast for however long is tolerable just to see what it does, especially after a stall. And sometimes it does nothing. (laughs) It does absolutely nothing. And it's like, well, at least now I know that doesn't do anything. So I can safely go back to whatever I was doing and not worry about it. And to your point as well about the pulling the plug when you need to, I, you know, I recently was like, okay, I'm going to do a month of pretty hardcore restriction to like, you know, jumpstart something here because I think it's time. And I got into week two and I was like, I feel like a crazy person. Like I share the history of mental health issues. So I was like, I'm not well. And I am like, it wasn't exactly depression, but it was like, I just didn't feel right mentally. Less stable, I think, is how I describe it from my experience. Like the high carb experiment that I did, Uh oof, (laughs) bad. That's one of those ones I'm never doing again. And part of the reason is because it impacted my mood in the short term where there was less stability. And like normally my cheerfulness is like up here and it was like down here, just crying for no reason, all that type of stuff. And secondarily, because it had longer term effects of it took me two months to get closer to normal. And then I ended up having to cut dairy afterwards to get fully back to my mood normal. Mm-hmm. And that's not cool. <laughs> not cool. Yeah. Not cool. But, but I just, at that point, I was like, I said, I was going to do this for a month, but I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop right now. Like, I'm just going to go back to, I know what works because this is, I, nope, this is nope. You know, and it wasn't like I had to go to the hospital. It wasn't like there was any big thing. I wasn't, I was just like, mm, no, I don't feel right. Yeah, I had one experiment that lasted for exactly a day. And (laughs) it it was that I was trying to eat only fish for like a carnivore thing. And I, for some reason, didn't think it through because fish is incredibly lean. Even fatty fish is not actually that fatty. Not right, right. And during that first day, during my, my second meal or something, I was like, I am getting hungrier while eating. I'm not doing this anymore. And I stopped. <laughs> I like that's, that's a hard no for me. This I'm one like, was oh. poorly designed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Throw it in the trash. Think of something else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So tell me about the protein. Let's talk about the protein. Cause I am a big protein proponent these days, right? Like I'm very, I'm always like very, like, are you getting enough protein? Um, I'm like the mom, you know, like don't forget your sweater, <laughs> except I'm like, did you get enough protein? Um, so tell me about if I were, so what I'm envisioning, tell me if you if I'm wrong. It's like I cook a ribeye and my ribeye was like one of those with a really fat cap of fat on it, say. It had like a good inch of fat on the side and then there were little fat marbles in the middle. So I cut all the fat off of the more lean meat part of the ribeye and I ate those first. And then when I felt like I've had enough fat at this point, my hunger is somewhat satiated, I'm gonna start eating the meat part of this steak, the brown part, not the white part, um, until I feel like I've gotten enough of that as well. Is that approximately the approach you would take? Yeah, pretty much. Um, I think part of it can be confusing because sometimes people aren't familiar with what satiation feels like. Mm. (laughs) So it can be kind of difficult to describe, but during that first fat eating session, 
It's like you should have food on your fork and you should be bringing it up to your mouth and you should just be putting it back down because you cannot fathom eating another bite. And it's not because you're physically full. It's just the idea of more food is just, no, not it, like complete lack of interest. But then like you're looking at the meaty part, like the brown part, like you said, and you're like, oh yeah, I could eat that. And so you eat that until you reach that exact same stage with the protein and then you're done. And then you just do that again whenever you get hungry again. And I find that helpful to start with because I don't always eat fat first now because I have a good idea of like what ratios that I tend to feel best with. But starting out, it can help you get idea of, oh, I normally eat two to one uh, fat to protein in terms of grams when I'm doing this. So now I can start formulating my future meals to have that in mind. And then I can just go ahead with that. And there's some stuff that are already pretty close to two to one anyway, like Costco brisket. Good choice. Mm. Um, (laughs) Also pretty good. And a lot of stuff that you can buy in the store is just too lean. Like even ribeye is not anywhere close to two to one. No, it's one to one at best. Yeah. And so sometimes I'll be like putting butter on every bite. Like April did, for example, Um, I'll have a butter coffee occasionally. <laughs> Actually, oh no, are you occasion. a butter chugger? I'm right, a butter chugger. Um, right, yeah, so thing. I'll be drinking like my coffee with butter in it. It's actually not unusual at all, but I'll do that and then I'll eat my meal and then it'll, it'll be like a fat bolus <laughs> first if the rest of my meal is a little bit leaner than I would like it. All sorts of stuff. I also like making uh, like pickled pork fat or bone marrow is really good. Uh, in terms of fat content, all that type of stuff. And I find that useful just to start out with with the fat first. But yeah, it's an interesting experience. And I didn't expect there to be two hungers in terms of fat hunger and protein hunger. But that's definitely what I've experienced. And I've heard the same thing from other people as well. But Mm -hmm. I think one thing is definitely like, when you're going into it, you have to promise yourself, I'm going to eat until I'm satiated. Like there's none of this, oh, well, I'm not hungry anymore, but I'm not. I'm no longer starving. Yeah, I'm no longer starving. I'm going to stop. Because I think if you did that, then you could unintentionally start under eating and then you could actually be under eating protein. And that's not ideal. Got it. So you said earlier, like 12% protein, which to me sounds crazy low. But it's hard to know. Percentages are a mess when you don't know like the overall right. amount. Do you know like how many grams of protein do you average a day when you when you've tracked? Usually it's around like 70 to 90 grams of protein. And I'm 5'2 for reference. Yeah, you're I'm, a Kenyo. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm not a heavy exerciser or anything. Basically, the only yeah. exercise I do is I go on, you know, mile or three walks every day and I occasionally go hiking. I should have said pequeña. You can tell I don't speak Spanish very well. Um, Okay. It's not actually a low protein diet. I mean, if you go on Diet Doctor, they have their like recommended protein amounts per ideal body weight or whatever. And I'm like on the lower end of that, but I'm not below it. Right. I mean, it's lower than what I would do, but I eat a ton less fat. So yeah. So like things are going to shift if you eat less fat, typically you eat more protein and vice versa. Right, right, right. Right. And I'm taller, but yeah. Yes. Um, so yeah, I mean, so, so- yeah, I would yeah. categorize keto AF is not a low protein diet and it's not mm-hmm. a protein restricted diet. I would say it's an mm-hmm. adequate protein diet with emphasis on fat. Right. And that's the problem with percentages. They're helpful in doing calculations, but they're not helpful in communicating sometimes because, <laughs> because when you say 12%, I'm like, holy moly. Um, Must be like but, 30 grams of protein, but right. no, <laughs> definitely when not. You're eating quite a bit of fat. Yes. Or quite yeah. a bit of caloric intake from fat. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why it makes up the bulk of the percentage. But yeah, and I definitely don't want to get any misconception across like, oh, you shouldn't eat any more protein than what I'm eating because that's bad for you. It's not the point. And I think everybody is going to come to different protein amounts on keto right. AF, depending on what they're doing. If they're an exerciser, they may need more energy and more protein or more protein. Who knows? I also don't like saying, oh, with keto AF, you need to eat two to one because that's not, again, it's working off of your own appetite and mm-hmm. that's going to change depending on your body any type of healing that's going on, any type of exercise you're doing, all this type of stuff. 
And so I like to emphasize the eating to appetite part and don't force ratios just because you think it should be there. It's like people, right. you know, it's like I have to eat 80% fat and then they're like chugging olive oil. I've seen issues with people doing that too. <laughs> it's like, you don't need to do that. Right. So even if some, if you went into it and you, I mean, I guess, so. see this, I have to explain how to do an experiment to people that don't experiment, but this is how I would do it. And you can tell if you did me, if you did something different is I would probably cut all my fat pieces and maybe whatever butter or anything I might be adding, measure it all out. What I thought I might eat in a meal, measure weigh and measure it all out with a scale. Then I would do what you said, which is to start eating the fat parts first and then stop when I was full and then move on to the leaner. There's still some fat in that meat part, but you know, the leaner part second and then stop. And then it would weigh what was left over of each one of them. And then I would write down how much I actually ate versus what I, you know, how much I actually ate. Cause what you think you're going to eat isn't the experiment. It's what you actually eat. Yeah. And then, and uh, yeah, that's actually exactly what I did for <laughs> the initial experiment is yeah. I prepped a whole bunch and I was like, I don't know how much of this I'm going to eat, but I'll just wait up beforehand, ate whatever until I was satiated, couldn't fathom eating another bite. And then I weighed whatever was left. And then I charted it down. And then at the end of, I think that was three and a half weeks, I kind of overlooked everything. Mm -hmm. And I think for that one, I was more around like 2.5 grams of fat to one gram of protein. So I tend to go pretty high, but that's what I ended up landing at. And if anyone tried that, and then it was like, they were 1.8 grams of fat to one gram of protein. It's like, okay, cool. Well, you know, that's what you need. Plant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, got it. Got it. Yeah. You think real hard. So your brain needs a lot of energy. That must be it. I that have actually it. heard from Amber that there was a study where they were like doing a chess tournament and they found that their resting energy expenditure went up. <laughs> while <they're laughs> chess. So well, doesn't our brain use like 25% of our caloric needs or something like huge that? Huge amounts and yeah. thinking does take energy. So yeah. Ultimate weight loss strategy. Just think real hard. <laughs> the new IQ test. What is your resting metabolic rate? Um, so anyway, jokes that geeks make. Um, okay, well, that makes sense. And then people are probably like, do I really have to weigh and measure everything? I guess not. It's just like, not if, really. you're, if you're curious about it, then you'll want to know maybe. But, you know, yeah. it, this is more an experiment around it's eating to satiety, right? Which is a lot of people say that. Yeah. And some people do just go for the eating until they're full and then they don't really worry about the rest. Like, yeah. I know this is visually, this is clearly two to one um, in terms of the macronutrient grams. I'm just going to eat this to satiety and not really worry about it. Right. The measuring and stuff is more helpful if you're intending to have mixed meals in the future. So it's like, I know this is about two to one and then you can just eat it as a mixed meal instead of separately. I'm a big proponent of tracking and measuring and that kind of stuff, at least to get a baseline. So, you know, mm -hmm. so that, you know, and then yeah. you'll also know if you actually are under eating protein, like if you actually are eating 40 grams a day of protein. Yeah. In this case, it could be reassuring in that sense, because you could feel like, wow, this was not a lot of protein. Clearly I'm under eating protein. And then you actually end up weighing and measuring. And it's like, phew, this is actually within the recommendations for someone of my size. Right confirm. So what do you think is going on in the background, right? Because like, if we apply standard theory to eating, a lot of people would say, well, it totally makes sense if I lower the fat and raise the protein that I will get leaner. Because as some people will say, if I have fat on my body, I don't need to ingest as much fat because I'm trying to burn the fat on my body. Um, that's, you know, often the argument. And like, in all honesty, I, you know, to the listener, sometimes my argument, um, you know, so I'm not, <laughs> yeah, I'm I think not for some people, that untrue. is true. I think yeah. for some people, that is true. If you limit energy, then you'll take from your body stores. However, I think one thing that can get maybe confused or can be confusing is that just because you have a lot of body fat doesn't necessarily mean you have a lot of access to it. Right. So one of the things that insulin does, for example, is it shuts off access or limits access to body fat. And so if you have very high insulin, it may be that if that high insulin is persisting, even when you're not eating, which I've definitely seen 
in people before that you may feel starving during a fast and may get hungry pretty immediately because even though you have a ton of stored energy, you just don't have easy access to it. So I think that may be one thing that's playing into it. The people who struggle with higher protein and when they try it, they feel hungrier and they find they're not getting satiated. That may be one aspect where they just don't have access to stored energy that they would need to support that. And so then the focus could perhaps be on getting insulin down in terms of resolving whatever is making the insulin high, <laughs> which can be complicated. <laughs> right. So would a person who's going to do well on keto AF not, would they tend to be somebody in your mind? Obviously, I'm, you're not the expert on keto AF of the world, but there are not that many experts of keto AF. If somebody didn't do well with fasting, right? So they tried to fast and they found it very, they were very hungry, very weak, they didn't feel great, which would tend to be an indicator. It could be an indicator of several things, electrolyte imbalance and problems like that. But it could all, if they're like, I tried it several times and I tried it and I did all these things right that people tell me to do, that could potentially be an indicator that they're not in a hormonal state to access body fat for energy, which means they're just supremely under fueled during that fast. Yeah, that is actually one thing that I start asking people about. If mm. they're like, do you think keto AF is something I might be interested in trying? It's like, well, how do you do when fasting? When you're eating higher protein meals, are you getting satiated or are you getting hungrier or just not getting full? Um, stuff like that. And yeah, the fasting is one thing that I find very interesting because it is somewhat of a commonality of people I've seen where it's exactly as you described, they may be even obese and they even not eating between meals, like they'll eat a proper meal size and they won't get full from the meal. And after a while, it's like, okay, well, I have to stop at some point. So I'll just stop here. But then they're hungry very soon after and then if they try and fast, it'll just be absolutely miserable, no energy whatsoever, super irritable, and even, you know, staying on top of electrolytes and stuff like that. So it mm -hmm. is something I tend to ask about. And again, it's not a guarantee if you experience those things, you know, it could be any number of things. Right. Like you said, it's just something I ask about because I'm a little bit curious mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. One of the things that I noticed when I made my switch to what I would call higher fat to higher protein, capitalized E, right, higher, um, is, uh, is now that I've gotten used to eating a lot more protein, if I under eat protein below what I'm used to eating now, I'm ravenous. Like, I'm like, mm. oh, no, this is not going to work for me. I need, but if I go much lower, I sort of have a minimal fat threshold. And if I go much below that, I'm like, oh, where's the fat? Like, I, I can sense when I'm like low on either one. And it makes yeah, me feel that's like good. That's yeah. good, though. Um, yeah. And irritable. I think that is that is important to be aware of your own experiences of if I do this thing, I don't feel well, or I'm really irritable, or I'm really hungry. And keeping that in mind, regardless of what you're doing, because ultimately, like you said, this has to be sustainable, like it's all well and good to try something and then you do it for like a week. It's like, wow, I got these tremendous results. And then it's like, but I can't keep <laughs> if doing you stop it. doing it, then it's not gonna work anymore. <laughs> right, right. So, so you would say now I will, I will caution people, I find I don't you might find this different. The first week I change anything, I'm irritable. Like I'm like, this is different. I, I don't I agree. like different. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, even when I first went carnivore, like the first week was a total mess. Awful, yeah. And I was like, is this electrolytes? Is it because it's not enough fat? I think it's just a transition thing. Yeah. If I make any hard switch, there's usually like a week period where it's like my body doesn't know what's going on. It's just be annoyed at everything. Right, right. right. You got to you got to let yourself get through that. Now, let's talk about one detail with this, because there is some very high fat carnivore food that is a little more what's the word controversial dairy mm, I got dairy dairy <laughs> so I will it, say before yeah. anyone gets mad some people can eat dairy and be perfectly fine but some people it can be a problem actually two of the most 
common problem foods I've ever come across in the keto community is nuts, comes up all the time, including peanuts, even though they're not technically a nut, and dairy. Regardless of whether it's high fat or high protein, people will talk about having stalls, not having an off switch when they're eating it, not being able to get satiated from it. It's sad, but those two are very common. And I think uh, if you're eating carnivore and you're including dairy and you're not seeing the results that you want, skin issues are still lingering, you know, whatever it could be, I think it may be worth looking into stopping the dairy for like a month just to see, (laughs) even if you may not be happy about it, and hope that it does absolutely nothing and you feel just as not great. (laughs) Because then at least I would like to feel just as bad. No, (laughs) yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I call myself Captain Joy Kill um, sometimes because because you have to tell people things like that. But so, how do you do with dairy? Well, I used to do pretty well with it actually. Uh, During my first year of carnivore, I was pretty much exclusively eating pork chops and cream cheese for every year. Just I remember that. Yeah, (laughs) that's what I was craving, and it's what I wanted, and. I would try beef and I'd be like, not for me. I don't want it. Uh, And that (laughs) kind of shifted after a while. And it was fine. I love dairy. I eat dairy of all sorts, goat cheese, heavy cream, hard cheeses, whatever. And then in 2017, actually directly after the high fat carnivore experiment, I did a period of, you know, going back to the 30% protein carnivore to regain the weight that I had lost in preparation to do the high carb experiment, because I wanted to be weight stable for that. And that experiment, it was black beans and uh, chicken breast and some spices. And then eventually I needed to up carbs even higher. So I added honey and bananas. And By the way, people, I, this is not a keto approach. This is not keto. She, this was, she was doing an experiment. In, yeah, this was intentionally not keto. I had wanted to try something, basically do high carb, high calorie for a period of time and then get blood work done, see what changed, all this type of stuff. And honestly, I was hoping it wouldn't have that big of an effect because it's like black beans, like it's whole food, basically. (laughs) I mean, you could argue about the honey, but I mean, plenty of people eat honey and they're fine. It messed with my mood, like I said, during and in the two months afterwards. And I gained 17 pounds during the experiment, but then also in the aftermath. So in the aftermath, I went back to high fat carnivore eating. And you kept gaining weight. Dairy, And I kept gaining weight, uh, which I was not happy about, (laughs) especially because I had a presentation to give right after that. And I was like, cool. (laughs) Uh, And someone actually did comment on that. It's like, "Uh, did you gain weight? It's like, yes, I did. Thank you for asking. Uh, Yeah, that was a mess. But the main point of this is that after that, I didn't lose the weight again, even though I stuck with carnivore and I was like, what the heck is this? And I was still having lingering mood issues. I was having social anxiety again, which hadn't happened for a long time. I was more unstable, like you said, not in like a psychotic way, but just things affected me a lot more than they typically do way more sensitive, all that type of stuff. And eventually, for some reason, I was like, what if I just try no dairy? Like I had done that before and there had been no difference at the time. And I was like, well, I mean, things have apparently changed. So I might as well try it, see if it does anything. And if not, great, I'll keep eating dairy. And what ended up happening is the first effect I noticed was my mood improved. And I was like, oh, no, (laughs) because for me, it's like my mood is paramount. Like a big reason I stick so close to keto is for the chronic depression management. I like not being depressed and I like being mentally stable and happy. So getting rid of dairy and then my mood improving, it's like, okay, well, regardless of the weight thing, this is going to have to stay out. But then after about seven to nine days of no dairy, I started losing weight. I was like, oh, this sucks. (laughs) So I used to do fine with it. And then I did this dumb high carb experiment that blame uh, the black beans. Yeah. Black beans. Boo. Uh, And I'm sure plenty of people can eat black beans and be fine, but apparently not me, or at least not in those quantities or whatever combination of things that it was. Um, And so, yeah. And then I went through an additional year of being like, dairy is the problem. And then I kept eating it. (laughs) 
<laughs> I would I would mentally trick myself and I'd be like, well, what about uh, goat cheese? Goat cheese is fine. Or, oh, I'll just have a little bit. I'll have like some once a week and that'll be fine. But even including dairy once a week, it would stop mm. the weight loss immediately and I'd go back up wow. to that set point again. It's wow. like, so it took a year of knowing that it was not working for me and it was causing issues with my mood. And... I would go a period of time and then I'd be like, I'll just have a little bit. And then I would just be eating it all the time again. Uh, And finally, uh, let's see, I think it was like into February this year. I was like, this has got to (laughs) stop. Like my mood, not great. And I have so much work to do and all this stuff going on. I just can't deal with it. And so I cut dairy out pretty much for good. I've had one case where I got sick and had a fever Uh, I think like a month or something ago. And I was like, if this fever continues into the next day, I'm going to have mammoth ice cream because I feel sucky. And But it'll Mm. only be one pint. And I had the one pint and I didn't have any more. And I haven't had any more since then. (laughs) All right. Now, do you include butter in your dairy prohibition? Uh, No, actually, because I've been able to get satiated from butter. I can have butter as much as I want. It doesn't cause any weight loss issues anything like that. So butter seems safe for me, ghee as well. And I've heard that a lot from people actually, that if they have problems with dairy generally, sometimes they can have butter and it's fine. I don't know if it's like a protein, dairy protein thing or something that's not in butter that is in other dairy. No idea, but I'm glad I can still include it. (laughs) Got it. Okay. So at this point, how much weight have you been able to lose total and doing keto AF? Um, let's see. So total, it would be, let's see, so that's 40 and then another. So yeah, I think I'm still around 80 pounds, but I think part of that is also that since moving to Colorado, I've gained muscle because I walk everywhere mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Um, I need to get an updated DEXA. But uh, yeah, so about 80 pounds still is where I'm sitting and then from keto AF, I don't know, probably like 10 or 15 or something like that. Not a huge amount, but for someone my stature, it's noticeable. Right. And I have like baby, not really abs, but I have abdominal definition. So that's nice. Right. You got a very small waist. And that's interesting. So have you done DEXA? Have you compared your muscle mass, your lean body mass before keto AF and and more recently, or do you need to get a a scan? I need to get an updated one. I have one from before where my muscle mass was actually fairly low. Um, So I need to double check that again, but I'm intending to do that within the next couple of months. The only holdup is that there's just not a Texas place near me. So I'd have to like go Mm -hmm. into Denver, which is a whole thing. Got it. So an abrupt change, but not exactly. One of the things that you and I had talked about was um, you've been recently diagnosed with a, a condition. Would you call it a condition? What, what would yeah, you term sure. it? Yeah, okay, I, sure. I usually say condition. I mean, yeah. sometimes I, you could call it like a disorder, but that sounds kind of mean. <laughs> All right. So, uh, and it's specifically around body fat, right? Or, yeah, or it, it relates to body fat. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so the condition is called lipedema, and it's actually not discussed very much at all, even in the keto community, anything like that. Just in general, a lot of doctors don't even know about it. Uh, It's primarily characterized by disproportionate limbs is one of the noticeable features of it. So you end up getting a disproportionate amount of fat, usually like from the hips down to the ankle, or there's a type where it's like the hip to the knee, basically lower body. And then a lot of the times it also involves the arms, which is where it's the worst for me. And there's a lot of mystery surrounding it. (laughs) Like what causes lipidema? It's this whole thing. There is some evidence that it's at least related to connective tissue disorders. I mean, fat itself is a loose connective tissue, but connective tissue is in collagen and stuff like that. One of the common things that comes along with it is hypermobility, which I also have. So I can bend my fingers backwards and (laughs) uh, knees are also affected. Lots of fun there. Um, I've also had issues where my arm, like my shoulder will start slipping out of the socket, which feels gross. Mm. 
as you'd expect, but that's also fairly common with lipedema. And another interesting feature of it is that almost everyone who has it is female. <laughs> so mm. it almost entirely affects women. There are some men who develop lipedema, but usually it goes hand in hand with uh, being estrogen dominant and low testosterone. Got so, it. And so, I, so, you know, the, the typical look of a advanced lipedema case is almost as if they have a pair of pants on made of skin and fat. fat. Like, yeah, it's, it's like on top of, it looks like they have an ankle, but then they have like a calf that sits on their ankle almost like there's a, yeah. a large amount of skin. Yeah. So what you're talking about is called cuffing and okay. it happens because the excess fat is on the limb, but then once it reaches that ankle or the wrist, I have wrist cuffing as well, um, it stops. So it doesn't Mm. affect the hands or the feet, which helps differentiate it from other conditions that can cause swelling and stuff in those areas. Um, So the fat accumulation doesn't happen on the hands or the feet. And so you have this abrupt stoppage. Got it. Got it. And one of the things that you often see is, right, that it'll be somebody who's you might not notice it if they were very, very heavy. And this is, obvi- you know, might've been the case for you, right? When you're heavy, you just seem kind of big all over. You start losing weight. And then you're like, why am I losing all my weight in my midsection? But I still have disproportionately heavy legs or upper arms. Or is that is that kind of what started you thinking? That's exactly what happened to me. So I used to be 240 pounds. Like I said, I had a 37 inch waist and now I have a 27 inch waist. So lost plenty of size from there. And I did reduce limb size for sure. Like my legs and thighs and arms are smaller, but it's gotten to a point where my waist like cannot really healthily get smaller, but my legs are still much larger. It's still very clear that they have a lot of fat on them and my arms as well. Like it's a lot. (laughs) And so, yeah, if you had looked at me before keto, you would have been just like, Oh, well, she's obese. She's, you know, big all over and would probably never pin lipedema on that. But it was after I went keto and started losing weight, it was like, oh, this is interesting. And I would often comment, yeah, I tend to lose from my waist and abdomen. And it seems like the fat on my limbs is just hanging around. It's not going anywhere. Is that is that viewable on a DEXA scan? Like are your body fat percentages by region really different? So the DEXA that I got didn't, I mean, it had like fat mass, but it was not the breakdown that I really wanted. Oh. So, yeah, I mean, maybe if you were like a expert lipedema person, you could look at the DEXA and be like, oh, yeah, but I'm not familiar enough with them to be like, oh, that's weird. Got it. Yeah, my the last DEXA I got, it actually was like this percentage body fat in the arms, this percentage body fat in the abdomen, this, and I, so I would, I was thinking, oh, you'd be able to maybe say like, oh, my arms are 40% fat, but my waist is 20%, and maybe you could see that yeah. difference, but so- I don't know. When I got diagnosed, one thing that the uh, lipedema specialist actually did is she used calipers in a bunch of different mm. areas. So she did it, uh, she would check to make sure that there wasn't lipidemic tissue, which feels kind of like grains of sand or like little hard pebbles, basically. They're called nodules. And she would double check that there wasn't any, and then she would measure in that area. So she did my back and then my arms and then my uh, legs and then the front of my thighs basically getting a good idea of where the fat is. And she's like, Mm -hmm. well, you know, if you take into consideration the lipidemic fat, which she could tell where it was, then really, if you didn't have lipidema, you would probably be about 25% body fat. And Mm -hmm. lipidemic tissue is making up the rest of that. It's like, okay, that's cool. So I think there are certain things that you can do, but even just visually, or one thing that (laughs) I'm currently obsessed with, like going up to other people, can I feel your arm fat? <laughs> or like, or like okay. your fat. Um, when lipedema comes up, <laughs> uh, because it you don't just walk up to strangers and say that. No, not usually. Not um, <laughs> but it does have this very specific texture to it. So mm-hmm. if you know, someone, now I'm squeezing in my arm. Yeah. So I've compared with friends of mine who I know don't have lipedema, and the fat is very smooth and it's almost like firm. 
And I mean, you could compare it to like the fat on a cut of pork or something like it has that smooth texture. It's all uniform. And with lipidemic fat that I've noticed, it tends to be very loose. So you can stretch it out a lot. Mm -hmm. And then it also has, um, in some cases, those nodules. So it's very loose and then it has a bunch of lumps in it. So I think that's also helpful to be like, oh, am I feeling this? And not everyone has involvement in the arms. So I can feel like around my hips in my inner thighs, that type of stuff. And then some on the lower leg as well. What is it? What is lipedema? <laughs> what? Good question. <laughs> right? Nice if we knew. Like I said, there are some ties to connective tissue disorders. But as for what causes it, it appears to at least be partially genetic tends to run in families. It affects primarily women. So maybe there's a hormonal component to it, all this type of stuff. But I mean, the honest answer is we don't know. We don't know exactly. And luckily, there's much more research being done on it now. Um, I mean, it was only, I think, identified in like the 1940s. So it wasn't even that long ago. I mean, in terms of a research perspective. But at the very least, we're now learning that there are some things that can help. And one of them actually appears to be ketogenic diets, which is, I guess, add it to the list. <laughs> um, I think and, it's like, you know, that did you ever see my big fat Greek wedding? It was terrible. You know, not a very I good saw movie. It once. <laughs> I know you're a little young, maybe. But in it, there's this grandpa Gus, and he puts Windex on everything, right? So like, you've got a zit, he's going to put Windex on it. You hurt yourself it's got windex you got a crack on like everything gets windex now i was like keto is the windex of <laughs> ever yeah yeah it's, it's like the duct tape of diets just slap exactly, some on exactly um but that's not to say that keto is a cure for lipedema like obviously mm. i still have it and the issue is that as far as i've read um one of the things with the nodules and the lipidemic tissue is that it's what's causing the nodules is essentially scarring of the fat tissue, as far as I understand it. And scarring is difficult to get rid of. So mm -hmm. one of the characteristics of uh, lipidemic fat is that even if you starve yourself, it won't go away. And that may be a component of it. Like there are pictures, even in Gary Taub's Good Calories, Bad Calories, I think there's a picture of an emaciated woman with lipidema. And it's like from the waist up, she looks like she's starved because she is and from the waist down it's there's still a bunch of fat there and that's the lipidemic fat so calorie restriction in terms of that is not helpful <laughs> well i what it seems like to me knowing nothing about it but watching some people like you and other people it's like you can lose body fat and you can lose body fat from the places where you have the lipidema right your arms and legs got smaller but once the smallest part of you reaches borderline unhealthily low body fat percentages, you still have other parts, the lipidemic parts that are well above what one would consider. Yeah. Low. And that's, that's the disproportionate part. And I think right. what may be happening there is as you're losing weight, you are losing weight from everywhere. You're losing fat from everywhere. You're losing yeah. fat from the healthy fat tissue in your mm. limbs. And what's remaining is that unhealthy lipidemic fat. Got it. So it's like, there's a mix of healthy and unhealthy fats in the part of the body. Like so not a hundred percent lipidemic yeah. it's maybe 50 50 but now you lost the 50 that was healthy and the 50 that is unhealthy is not going anywhere right and there is some discussion on scar tissue reduction and certain massage mm -hmm. therapies to try mm -hmm. and get rid of that and see further you know limb size reduction and stuff like that i personally haven't tried it yet although i am interested in doing it i'll probably try like one isolated part like my abdomen or something one, one one arm <laughs> and just see if it works. I had joked about that with Dave. Like, oh, maybe I'll do like one arm and I'll just be lopsided for a while. Um, but the main thing that I want to check with that is that if it does get rid of the scar tissue and fibrotic tissue there, that it doesn't come back because mm -hmm. I don't want to clear out tissue that may be like stabilizing <laughs> something. Oh, right, right. Yeah. I, the other question I had, and I don't know, you know, the answer to this, but is does liposuction or surgery can you cut it off? Can you remove it surgically? You can, yeah, you can remove it. Um, I think that's pretty much the typical thing is like you have compression gear, um, which helps because one of the other things is you'll have fluid accumulation in those mm -hmm. areas. So compression gear will help get that fluid out. And then 
massage, uh, lymphatic massage, and then liposuction is pretty much um, what's recommended at the moment. I'm personally not interested in liposuction because for one, it's expensive. And for two, I don't know, I just kind of painful. Want- yeah, there's recovery, all this stuff. And right. surgery and, and I will, you know, for those of you that, I mean, not that I want to classify, but I would say if people don't know what Siobhan looks like, her appearance does not scream, I have a body fat disorder, right? Like you are what would probably be called a fairly light case, I would imagine. Yeah. So stage one is yeah. uh, how I'm classified. So very early stage. And I would like to think that's partially because I went keto so early because- mm-hmm. I haven't seen any advancement really since I've gone keto and granted all of that is looking, you know, backwards and all this type of stuff, but my arms haven't gotten bigger. My legs haven't gotten bigger. The only case where they did was after the high carb experiment, my arms got bigger. Mm. So it seems like one, one of the important factors in keeping lipedema under wraps, if you will, uh, is not gaining body fat overall right? If you can keep that lower. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably a combination of, I guess how I would think of it would be trying not to induce an environment that will cause body fat gain. Cause that typically mm-hmm. goes along with, you know, metabolically unhealthiness and all that type of stuff, which I don't think is helpful. And one component that I haven't mentioned yet, but is obviously super important is that lipedema is also called a painful fat disorder. And Mm. that's because the areas that are affected can be extremely tender, especially to pressure. And also they can just hurt all the time (laughs) and it's not fun. But so when I mentioned keto, one of the big aspects to that is it seems to help with a variety of things. Number one is swelling in the affected limbs And then there's also helping with that pain. So plenty of people I've seen in the groups have commented that when they went keto in comparison to other diets, keto was the thing that really helped with the tenderness and the achiness and the pain. And sometimes there's some stuff in the studies about uh, muscle weakness and not as much muscle as you would expect in the limbs that are affected. And another thing that people comment on is like with repetitive movement, there can be like this lactic acid burn that happens really quickly. So your limb gets really tired. Um, And I've noticed that has been helped a little bit as well, especially with keto AF. And I wonder if that's just flooding the system with additional energy. So, because if you think about it, right, like the lipidemic fat is not healthy fat and it doesn't appear to be functioning correctly. And that's sitting directly next to the muscle. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Dave has talked about in terms of the cholesterol system and the fatty acid metabolism stuff is that one thing that fat cells might be able to do is they may be able to provide fatty acids directly to the muscle adjacent. And that may be important for the muscle. So with lipedema, it could be that that's getting messed up because the fat next to the muscle is not functioning properly. So with my thing, it's like, well, maybe that's better for me with keto AF because I'm just supplying (laughs) additional energy to kind of make up for that. Um, But yeah, the pain thing is massive because even if keto isn't a cure, this is a quality of life thing. And for me, I definitely had noticed growing up that my arms were very tender and people would just like grab my arm to get my attention. And I'd be like recoiling away and it would just be this lingering soreness for like minutes afterwards. It'd be like, why are you overreacting? I barely touched you. It's like, I'm not. (laughs) And now I can finally be like, that's why I wasn't overreacting. I knew that much, but the reason it was so tender was because of the lipedema. And then also easy bruising is another thing in the affected areas that comes up as well. And so, yeah, for me, it's, I've gotten a range of reactions from people when I announced that I had been diagnosed and some of it was like, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's really sucky. But from my perspective, it's like, well, nothing has really changed. (laughs) If you think it's still in this body and yeah. yeah, I'm still in this body. I'm still experiencing all the same things, but the main difference is I know why certain things are happening now. And I don't feel as crazy (laughs) because I can be like, Well, if someone is like, oh, you're still 
you know, a fat on carnivore, first of all, this stuff is complicated, but also second of all, no, I'm not <laughs> like my waist is right. in the healthy size. It's not, no, no, it's just, I have a condition. Big deal. Right. 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 So if somebody suspects based on what you've talked about, the, like the feeling like they have BBs under their skin or, yeah, I'll say given that I'm probably close to twice your age, like the fat on my arm is pretty loose, but that's mostly because the skin has stretched out. Yeah. Um, or, but, or you, you could know, have lost weight and you just have like loose skin or whatever. Skin. But that, you know, if, if people first have the, the easy bruising or the painful limbs or things like that, what should they do if they are wondering if they have lipedema? Well, I mean, number one would be to talk to your doctor about it and see if you can go through the diagnostic criteria with them, see if they also think that it sounds like lipedema to them as well, see if they can give you a referral to a specialist who can diagnose. But honestly, a lot of people with lipedema are self-diagnosed because most mm -hmm. doctors don't know about it. They have no right. idea it exists. They just think, oh, it's obesity. Oh, you know, I told this person to go on this super calorie restricted diet and they didn't lose any weight or whatever, or their thighs are still big, whatever. It's just because they're not complying, <laughs> which mm. plenty of people with run of the mill obesity have run into as well. And there's plenty of argument over that. But I mean, talk to your doctor, see if they're familiar with it, maybe try and bring material on them and kind of bring them up to speed, but also research, talk to other people with lipedema, see if, you know, you could rule it out, which could also be equally helpful. Um, and a great resource is Lipedema Simplified. And uh, Leslie Keith and Catherine Sayo work on that. And they have tons of resources, tons of information. And they actually published a paper talking about using ketogenic diets for lipedema, all this type of stuff. And, you know, diagnosis can be helpful because it can get you access to treatment that may not be covered by insurance otherwise. But sometimes doctors don't have the information. And so if you've done a ton of research into it, it's like, okay, I think this is a pretty good bet. You can take that to them. And then you may not only be helping yourself in your own situation, you may be helping their other patients who may have it too. So I think one big aspect of this is going to be educating doctors <laughs> like I did with mine. His initial reaction was kind of like, well, there's not much you can do about it. And it's like, well, there have been a lot of good things that have come up and you know, knowing that can be helpful. The compression gear for me has been helpful, especially mm -hmm. if I know I'm going to be standing for a really long time. I know I'll be <laughs> bringing it with me for conferences and stuff. And then the massage techniques, looking into what's available, and then also knowing that even if there's not much that we can do, I mean, there's no cure right now. There's plenty that we can do. But knowing that people are looking into it and that we're kind of learning about this together and we're finding information that's like, oh, I tried this thing and it was really helpful. So there are Facebook groups. Um, let's see, I think it's called Keto Lifestyle uh, for Lipedema is also run by Leslin and Catherine. They changed the name recently. So I have to try and remember. Okay. I'll throw some links in the show notes. Yeah. <laughs> so like all of those connecting with other people and talking and doing stuff like that. And then also those are private groups. So you can kind of compare photos and be like, does this look like it? Do you think this is it? And then, yeah, talking to your doctor. That's pretty much the same steps that I did. And how I actually discovered that I had it, how it was first pointed out, was mm -hmm. actually that I had posted before and after pictures from an experiment that I had done where I had lost weight. And three separate women with lipedema <laughs> private messaged me and were like, do you think you might have lipedema? <laughs> Do you have <laughs> lipedema? And I was like, I don't know what that is. Uh, and then I ended up looking into it and talking to my doctor. And finally, he was luckily able to set me up with a specialist. And that's how I got the diagnosis over in California. So got it. All right. Now there's another condition, which is different, but sounds similar, which is lymphedema, which yeah. is swelling of the lymph, right? Yeah. So it's swelling and it can be caused by various things like it can be uh, you can be born with it or it can be induced by some surgical things. Like one thing I've read up about more often than not is um, 
if you're diagnosed with breast cancer, one of the things that may happen is some of your lymph nodes may be surgically removed. And in mm. some cases that can induce lymphedema on the side where the lymph nodes were removed. So you'll have this one limb that's really swollen, painful, all this type of stuff. And the interesting thing is that the lymph accumulation will, uh, I mean, one thing that's speculated is that it induces the fat growth. And then, Mm. so you not only have this fluid accumulation, you also have fat accumulation in the one limb from that lymph just sitting there and not being able to properly exit out. And yeah, there's definitely overlap, I think, in some of the symptoms and how it presents. But one of the things with lipedema is that it tends to be bilateral. So it'll be evenly in the limbs. So I have it in both of my legs and then both of my arms. And with lymphedema, you can have it in just one limb or just on one side, things like that. And it may or may not be even. Got it. All right. Well, This was very educational. Do you feel like there's anything you want to clarify or touch on that we haven't talked about? Uh, I mean, not really. I don't think, I mean, the major factors are diet is not a one size fits all. We still have a lot to learn about lipedema, try different things. Uh, I'm not a doctor, can't give medical advice. Not a nutritionist, can't give diet advice. I can only say this thing worked for me or this thing works for some people I know. Maybe it'll be of interest. Who knows? (laughs) Got it. Okay. So uh, coming away from this conversation, understanding a lot more about your experience with lipedema, people listening, there will be some notes in the show notes about the groups that that Siobhan mentioned. Anything coming up interesting in, in the cholesterol code world? Cholesterol code world, we're mostly hunkered down (laughs) trying (laughs) to get things done. Um, Dave is working on the lean mass hyperresponder study, of course. I'm working on pretty much running on your labs and then also all this research stuff. One thing I do have coming up is I'll be speaking at the lipedema symposium in October. And I'll be talking about keto and lipedema there and why keto may be helpful because there's many different things that it may be contributing. One of the main things that's talked about is keto is helpful for weight loss. So maybe that's why, but I think there are also other factors that may be playing in. And I think those are important to talk about because even if keto is not for everyone, it's another option for a condition that doesn't have a whole ton of options right now. So anything Mm. better is better. Right. And then Own Your Labs is a online company that you can go to to order blood labs, right? Yep. And there's also a fun little aspect to that, which is, I mean, Dave has been complaining nonstop, like, ah, we need more data, we need more data. And so one of the things that you can do is at checkout, there's an option to anonymously submit your data to a basically a big old database of everyone who submits and it's completely optional. But um, that'll be open source. Anyone will be able to look at it. And of course, name, date of birth, anything identifying will be removed. There's also demographic information collected. So it's like, what diet are you on? What does that look like? Um, How long have you been on that diet? What's your body composition? And then all of that's added along with the test results in that database. And then we'll be able to be like, oh, what? what does carnivore blood work look like actually? (laughs) So that'll be fun. So yeah, it's just a little, little something and you get a uh, 10% discount if you opt in, but again, it's optional only for people who want to do it. Got it. So many people have started ordering their own labs. And so it's neat to have an option where you're actually supporting research within the low carb community by going to you know, make your dollars count there. So I just want people to know that Own Your Labs exists if they don't already and so that they can know that their dollars are going for some good causes. Yeah. And another aspect of that is that a portion of the proceeds are also going towards the Citizen Science Foundation, which is the 501c3 nonprofit that Dave and I have created. And that is currently the project that is focusing on is funding the lean mass hyperresponder study. So also note that some of your money, if you go through on your labs is also going towards that, which is all good and fun, good causes. 
All right. Well, thanks, Siobhan, so much for being on the podcast today. I really appreciate the time we spent together. Um, and where can people find out more about you if they want to learn more about like some speaking stuff or what's going on there? I usually announce everything on Twitter. It's at Siobhan underscore Huggins. That'll be in the show notes. So no one will have to attempt to spell it. <laughs> and then also, yeah, I tend to post updates to cholesterol code. And yeah, Twitter and cholesterol code, probably the best places to look for me. All right. Well, thanks so much for taking part in this and I will talk to you soon. Yep. See ya. See ya. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Keto Life Support. Want more information? Want show notes? Want to suggest a topic? Just head over to ketolifesupport.com. That's where all that kind of thing can go on. By the way, I have a request. If you could go to your podcast host and hit subscribe, we would really, really appreciate it. And what would be even more awesome is if you could write a review. And what would be even more awesome than that is if you could write like a really flattering review. Just asking, you know, you do you. <laughs>